Generative AI platforms are not only the flavor of the month, but arguably the flavor of the year. Many of these are web platforms, and I've always been the first to admit that I like good old fashioned offline first and native applications, especially on macOS. Electron applications need not apply and will not be covered in this video, where I look at some applications from a handful of enterprising developers who have used the API access to many of these new services to create, yes, offline first, macOS native applications. Before we begin, a quick caveat that you will notice in a few of the clips, and that is that often you need to download a model first. That's how they work offline. That can be a little bit of a network hit and a wait, but hopefully it's worth it. I am Christian Chiller. If you enjoy this video, you can find more about me at christianchiller.com, or of course you can subscribe Leave a comment below, give me a thumbs up, give me your feedback. Now, are you ready to meet your new productivity helpers or hinderers? Let's get started. A new entry into this space, and it's still in beta, is Adobe Photoshop, leveraging some of the features of Firefly, which I've actually covered in recent streams, but building them straight into certain aspects of Photoshop. This is quite powerful. It's not exclusively Mac native, of course, but Neither are some of the other options here, but let's have a look at some of the things you can do with it. So I have this image here. A lot of things revolve around selecting areas and then generating something there. So what I'm gonna do first is adding things to the foreground. So I basically select an area and you get this little context box popping up where you type your prompt. So this is all sort of relating to a story I'm working on. So I'm gonna put two men. I don't know if it can handle typos, so let me fix those. And costume isn't quite right, it should actually be clothes. There we go. And now we hit generate. It takes a little bit of time, actually, and there's no real sense of progress. So you're not quite sure how close it is to, to finishing. So I will cut here and get back to you in a moment when it's done. And that took a few seconds. I did this earlier and got slightly different results. These ones look slightly surreal. This person here looks kind of scary as well. <laughs> you can also click through, it gives you three options in each case. There may be settings to change that. And that's, they're all a little surreal, but, uh, and then of course in each case, if you notice as well, it changes the background ever so slightly each time. So I might say thumbs up to that one. There's a lot of arms in that. So let's say thumbs down to that one. And I actually wanted two and there's three. So that's definitely a thumbs down. Okay. And we can see some other options here as well. We could also just generate again, but I'm gonna move on for now and go to the next feature. The next thing you can do is change the background. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. I could use the, uh, the selection tool to select the background, or you can actually select the whole canvas and it sort of figures out where the background is, but maybe we'll give it more of a, <laughs> more smarts here in this time. So we have the background selected. It's a sunny day here. I remember taking this photo. It was a very bright and warm and sunny. So let's change it to dark cloudy skies and rain. Again, we give it a little bit of time to think about it and wait. And you can see here, there's a few, I'm not completely sure what these are, they could be remnants of things from the selection that got lost, but generally it's quite good. So we'll give that one a thumbs up. Have a look at the next one. It's sort of better in some respects. So we'll give it another thumbs up. And then that one, it's fine. There's a little bit of sort of patterning over here and this patch, but that could be just from the initial selection. Maybe not. Yeah, so that's also quite cool quite useful. The next feature is the ability to be able to extend images. So firstly, we have to go to the canvas and we change the size of the canvas. And I do have this on both sides, but we'll just go for one side right now. Select the area we want to extend into. And again, you do the generative fill. We'll say these are quite specific to Melbourne and an era in Melbourne. They look a little bit like this building here, but I'd like to fill it out. I'm not sure if this is also going to be enough space. 
Uh, but let's see. Again, it goes away and has a thing. And yes, that might be a little narrow, uh, the selection, but it's not bad, actually. Um, this is a little, looks like it's made of wood, but this is pretty accurate. And I like the fact it's also reproduced trees as well. And we can see some other suggestions. It's not really a California bungalow, but it does look like a bungalow is by definition usually single story. But this does look um, pretty um, on era and style. And there's sort of a roof here that's reasonable. It looks accurate. I think the space is maybe the problem there. There's not enough space to fill it in properly, but it's, it's not too bad, not too bad. And then the last feature is the ability to remove objects. But it does this in actually a slightly different way. The documentation is not completely clear on this. It doesn't remove them like just transparency because you can sort of do that by default. It does something else. I'm gonna focus on this door because it's probably the best example. So, I will select the door here. And then it's, it's sort of strange. You just basically don't put a prompt <laughs> to remove it. And again, it has a think. You see, curiously, <laughs> this looks rather odd. It looks like it bricked it up. It removes it, but adds something else. So that's another door, another door, for example, some slightly strange looking doors. So it doesn't really remove it per se, it kind of changes it, uh, which, is, which is an odd one. I actually wonder if a better use case for this might be these windows because they're quite dark in the original picture. So we could potentially fill them in. Let's make them consistent at least. <laughs> and let's just remove them. I mean, we could also change it. Let's try that in a moment. So this is the removal. Mm. Didn't change it that much, I suppose. Let's have a look at some of the other options. Yeah, it's kind of weird actually. Let's go back to the selection. Let's actually add in a prompt instead. This is actually a post office, but yeah. Again, I wonder how clever this is because it's they're all connected. And obviously there's things happening behind the, the walls that you can't see. This may be a little beyond some of these tools right now, but let's see what happens. It's not too bad. It's sort of a little bit, odd looking, these people look kind of strange, but it, it sort of works, it works for the most part. And you might have noticed there's some other links here. We can do things like modifying the selection, invert the selection, transform, all sort of just standard Photoshop related tools that might relate to what you're trying to do. And that is basically it. Interesting beginning. I like the fact they're focusing primarily on amending things, not creating things from scratch. I don't know what would happen if you just did it on a blank file, I guess it would still work. But, uh, and there's a lot of terms attached to Photoshop and Adobe Firefly as well, which is also kind of good. I think they're going about it from the right start point. Next is Mac Whisper, another application created by Geordie Bruin. So you can find it over on his Gumroad website. It wraps Whisper, the OpenAI audio to text engine and it wraps specifically the C++ version in a native Mac application. It actually has had some updates recently so I'm going to look at some of those as we go through it and it all works locally which is quite cool. I'm going to use it as an excuse to compare to two other services Riverside and we can see a transcript of the same file here. This obviously gives you a bunch of other uh, features. We're interested in comparing the transcripts here and you can see the quality of the text. It's also recognized the speaker. I also have Otter, uh, pretty similar. It's done some other of its own features, keywords, it's recognized the speaker, etc, etc. Let's have a look at Mac Whisper. So first you need to download a model. You get access to certain ones if you don't pay and then certain if you do. So far I have generally found that the free options are pretty good. I will download small in English for now. That will take a moment. Okay, and as you can see, there's also an option to manage a lot of these, which is quite nice. Let's make that a bit bigger. All right, as you can see, there are a few features here. Let's just start with the basic one first. We'll open the file, load it in. This again will take a little bit of time. It is working locally. We can have a quick look to see what's happening. 
and you can see it's using a fair chunk of the CPU. I don't hear any fans going, so I'm assuming it's hopefully using the neural engine uh, and the other sort of AI features of Apple Silicon. So that's good. It will still take a little bit of time. So let's cut ahead to that. So that took about five minutes and the fans did go in the end. But actually, when you're using Otter or Riverside or any of these other tools, they also take some time. It's 34 minutes of audio. You can see that it presents itself in a couple of different ways. We have the transcript here, which is <laughs> in a very verbose uh, format. We can manually add speakers at the moment. I think automatically identifying speakers is a feature that's coming. Um, we can also do a big search and replace. And that's pretty much it. We can see like a subtitle style. So this would be exporting into SRT or something like that. And segments here. So I think probably the, the biggest issue is the the viewing of it the the transcript is quite good and we can actually have a look here i generally use a lot of uh, custom terminology because i'm dealing with tech this one is a little less technical actually uh just very quickly looking through the text here as much as you can see it it looks to be fairly accurate if we have a look at otter it looks pretty much the same if we have a look at Riverside, it looks also pretty much the same. It's hard to tell in this particular one if I'd use something involving lots of technical terms, maybe it would be different. If we want to export from here, we can get the transcript again, the SRT file, VTT, these are all caption style formats, sentences, a little better formatted, speaker paragraphs, that's a little bit more helpful, CSV, and then some other formats as pro. I wonder what CSV would look like. Oh, I see. Interesting. Okay. So some of these features are probably more useful when it comes to pro and when the automatic detection is added. But what else can it do? It can actually do some other interesting things. You can also just record right through. The one area I've always found this slightly confusing is knowing what input it's using, but I can just start recording and I can wait to see if it can understand what I am saying whilst I am recording. And we can transcribe. Yeah, so you get the idea pretty much as expected. We have a transcribe podcast option as well, where you can drop audio files for each speaker, separating the dialogue. So this is sort of filling that gap of the speaker identification that's sort of missing right now. And another interesting one is this record app audio. And this is interesting because I actually use applications like Audio Hijack to do this. And this has this bundled in. So what this means is, again, is a little bit fiddly to know which input it's using. But for example, I am recording in OBS right now. So I could select this. It shouldn't mess up uh, anything else, but um, I can record, uh, but it's a premium feature. That's fair enough, I pay for Audio Hijack, so there we go. But you get the idea, recording system audio, and this is actually quite a powerful feature. And Audio Hijack does not have transcription built in. Let's have a quick look at some of the settings. We saw the default uh, display mode, we already saw that. Font sizes, notifications, global find and replaces, manual adding speakers, and then you just choose them pretty much and what we'd seen earlier about the model management. And that is Mac Whisper. Amazing AI is another one actually covered before. It's basically a Mac native wrapper around Stable Diffusion, so it's for image generation. Let's have a look. The interface is relatively straightforward. Um, it's just a sort of wrapper here. Settings are up here and have a look at the number of images to create, the steps, the balance between speed and quality, the guidance between creativity and the prompt, and a few other things like that. Uh, and we type the prompt up here. So hmm, let's say, okay, we hit enter. This again will take a little bit of time. And much like some of the other tools in this, it's happening locally. So it's using our computer's resources. So activity monitor may spike let's see it's not 
terrible, <laughs> but it is definitely doing something. Okay, images take a little bit longer, especially in this version of the tool anyway, and uh, there's a lot of fan noise. <laughs> but here's the results. Um, Prompt engineering, as it's called for images, I will admit, takes a bit of work. That's a bit odd. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. That one is also a bit odd. This one has got at least the right elements, but they're all sorts of in the wrong places. This isn't bad, actually. And from here, you can make variants. You can download it, which is also interesting. That kind of, oops, that kind of thing. So here, for example, it's a little limited. Using some of the online ones is possibly easier. You get more features, but it's just an option there if you would rather do things offline than using some of those services. Writer's Brew lurks up in the menu bar and you can see a series of presets that you can trigger basically just by selecting text in a text editor. It will then offer you the option of popping up in a separate chat window or filling where you happen to have the text selected. Let's try a few here. You can have your own presets or you can pick from some ones that have already been created. So there we go. Explain it like I'm five and I created this uh, preset myself. You could also create some if you wanted to. There we go. <laughs> Very Lovecraftian. It's quite fun. <laughs> so that's that's sort of so useful. There's also a community library of presets if you want. In the settings, you can change different keyboard shortcuts, the way it's triggered, and where you want the text to go. I will stick with the chat window for now. The accuracy versus creativity, the model you're using, your key, how it looks in the menu bar, etc., etc. Let's have a look at using it in a text editor. So I select this and I say continue writing. It has a bit of a think. Up pops this chat window. And from here, we could copy, insert, send it elsewhere, and also improve and tweak here or ask follow up questions. So, don't know if this is actually going to work, but we can give it a go. Yes, it does. There we go. And just carrying on from there, refining what you'd actually like to paste back. Writer's Brew is available at writersbrew.app. It's updated regularly. The developer is very communicative. He's always shipping new features and it integrates with lots of other tools too, including some of my favorites like Raycast. Have fun. Next is Mac GPT. As the name implies, it's a Mac wrapper for ChatGPT available at macgpt.com. It's a familiar text chat style interface, but you can interact with it in a couple of different ways. So let's jump in and take a look. This is the standard chat interface. You can actually switch to just using the website embedded in the application as well. Not particularly useful. Or you can use it uh, in a native window and you will need an open AI key to do this. And as with many of the others, you can start a conversation and continue that conversation. And without providing any context, you can just continue. You can also switch to using it in the menu bar and you get the same context. And we can even make some typos and it should be able to figure out what we mean. <laughs> there we go. Voila. Let's have a look at some of the other options because it will show you some of the other ways we can interact. So here you can see where you can change the model and different sort of syntax. The web interface, which actually gives you the option to switch to GPT-4. The menu bar and you can toggle a shortcut here. The other option is this global keyboard shortcut, which is quite cool. You get a sort of spotlight style interface here. And you can hit enter and get the response print down in the output there. You can also get inline, which you need from using this 
plus GPT somewhere. So we type the trigger sequence and then the prompt. Type shift and enter. It has a think and then we get the text. There is no option to remove the prompt, which is similar in some of the other tools, but still we can just do that ourselves, I guess. Mac GPT is created by Geordie Brune, who has created a few of the other options in this video as well. And you can donate to support it. It does not have a commercial model, which is nice. Text Assistant is another option from Geordie Brune, who we've seen quite a few times on this roundup so far. And it pre-bundles as the website it says. I think it says it best. It uses... OpenAI, ChatGPT, et cetera, et cetera, to generate useful pieces of text built around these, these prompts, these styles of prompts you can ask to many of these tools. It comes with a few things built in. We have, again, and we've seen this before, a sort of general interface to ChatGPT. I think we've, we've seen this before, we get the idea. But then we get these predefined styles. So let's try explain like I'm five. The internet. And we've seen this in some of the other examples. I think you know what's going to happen. There we go. There's also useful options like creating into a tweet, for example. And this is not going to give you very much to go on, but you get the idea. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I didn't give you very much to go on, so I just made it up, which is, <laughs> which is perfectly reasonable. And then we can create a new prompt as well. So we take it in here. And we can, wouldn't really matter so much, but we can save it here and then yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> you can make this prompt text, of course, more descriptive, more useful, but you get the idea. And that's pretty much it really. And you have these default ones in the gallery and in the settings, you basically have your key, the model and the temperature you would like to use. So the creativity versus accuracy, as you see in some of these other tools. And that is the six tools I wanted to look at on this video. I hope you enjoyed following along with me there. And many of these were useful and well-designed, but I did find myself wondering many times, would I use them in a regular day-to-day -day process? And many of them I have kept installed and I haven't really referred back to them very much, to be honest with you. That might say more about me than the tools themselves. That is a very valid criticism. But what about you? If you've downloaded some of these, come back to this video. Tell me, have you used them in your day to day workflow or are these just all tools along the hype cycle that look cool, but really don't actually help us very much? Let me know and I will see you in another video soon. As always, more about me at christianchiller.com and you can subscribe, leave a comment and give me a thumbs up below. Much appreciated. Thank you very much for joining me.